difficulties in our lives and things we go through. But one of the things that never ceases to amaze me is the Word of God. This is called the Word. He's the living Word. And I don't know about you guys, but there's been plenty of times I've had to stand upon a promise in this Word and with no understanding, with no ability to know how I'm going to get through a circumstance. And we've got one in front of us now as a church, being dislodged to find another home. But the amazing thing is when you study this Word, every detail is connected, every part of it is connected, it's powerful. The Bible says that it's sharp and it's powerful, even to the point of dividing asunder bone and marrow. It's a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. So sometimes the Word of God's meant to pierce our hearts, it's meant to challenge us, it's meant to convict us, right? But a lot of times, the, I guess the church in general has come to a place where we like a, a lovey-dovey message without any challenge because we don't like to be challenged. But the Word's actually there to provoke us to righteousness and to challenge us by the Word of God. And uh, do you know nowhere in the Bible does it actually try and prove the existence of God? Uh, it just simply declares it. And we see that when we read Genesis 1, 1, the very first part of that scripture, and I, and I just love to, to, to say this, and I've said it plenty of times in this church, where it says, in the beginning, what's the next word? God. In the beginning, God. And so it starts out by making a direct declaration of God's existence. It says, in the beginning, God. So an invisible God who is creating visible things out of nothing. So his actions alone reveal who he is. And then man is created, who is visible, we can see each other, and begins to declare the things that are unseen, God, the things of God. And so right at the beginning you see a picture of the natural and the spiritual together. Or you could say the invisible creates the invisible, sorry, creates the visible, and then the visible starts being a witness about the invisible. <laughs> Sounds pretty crazy, right? <clears throat> and so straight from the very beginning, when you read this passage of Scripture, you see that God is dealing with the things that are seen and the things that are unseen, the visible and the invisible. And so God is showing us that he has no limitation. He is not restricted in any capacity whatsoever by things that are seen or even by those things that are unseen. He is simply declares that he is God. Amen? And now God gives us through his word by the spirit many promises. This book is filled with promises. Promises that he gives us. By his stripes you have been healed. That's a promise, right? And it's just filled with promises <clears throat> uh, which become the things hoped for. That word hope in the Bible is not like the word hope in the world where we go, well, I hope so, when we're just sort of a 50-50, we don't know how it's going to go. The word hope in the Bible is the word expectation and it means because God has said it, therefore I expect it to be so because it's his word, not man's. Amen? So whenever you read the word hope in the Bible, it means expectation. And this is the place where man must begin. And this is where faith begins. This is the starting point of Bible faith that God is and God exists. And this is the evidence of a, the inner knowing, I guess you would say, the, the, the witness that we have within the conviction of the reality of things not seen. For all that come to God must first believe that he is, that he exists, unseen, invisible, yet real. And that God alone, he says, is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him, for he is also a God that reveals himself to creation. Now, Matthew 7, 7, it says, uh, Ask and it shall be given. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened to you. For everyone that asks receives, and he that seeks finds. And to him that knocks it shall be opened. So although we say that our God is invisible to us right now, using these words that we understand, right? He is seen. And although we can't physically touch him, 
he is felt. And although he may seem distant to you at times, he is always with you and he will never leave you nor forsake you. So our God can be seen, he can be heard, he can be felt, and he can be found, yet invisible. <clears throat> Pretty cool, eh? Yet he's all-powerful, he's all-knowing, he's all-seeing, and he's omnipresent, meaning he's everywhere. <clears throat> you see, only a true living God could be able to fit into the visible and the invisible, the seen and the unseen, and then declare something like, I am always with you. Only God can do that. I mean, have you thought about this stuff? Or is it just my crazy mind, right? I think about stuff and I ponder these things because God doesn't fit into a box. Man wants to fit him into a box, but he's God. And again, I want to say there's no limitation with our God. The only limitation is actually with us. The limitation in our own ability to follow him or to trust him or to fully submit our lives to him and to believe, believe him at his word. And yet we see our invisible God who is constantly touching the visible. I mean, how many people have we seen set free in this church? How many people have we seen healed? The testimonies that have come forward in this church and in your lives. I can look around this room and each and every, or most of you people here could get up here and share for half an hour of what God has done in your life and where you've come from and where you are now and it's been nothing short of the miracle hand of God. Some of us have been given months to live and now the doctor's reports have been canceled and thrown away. Amen. And we could go on and on and on because we serve a God who is a miracle working God with no limitation. Hallelujah. But he's constantly touching the visible. He's bringing about his miracle provision. He's bringing his healing. He's bringing his comfort. He's bringing his peace. He's bringing his rest. He's bringing his fellowship. He brings us his joy. He brings us his protection and his love towards us. And you know, I just wanted to tell you a few things about God this morning. Because I think he's pretty awesome. Amen? And I want to encourage you, because I want each and every one of us to stay the course, to never give up on Jesus. Don't you give up on Jesus. I'm going to come banging on your door, right? Don't give up on Jesus. He's worth it. Because there's times I've contemplated walking away from the church and walking away from God because things were so hard. But don't give up. Don't give up. He's got to take us through the fire. Because there's things coming upon this earth. And God says that he will shake again the heavens and the earth, the land and the sea, and all that can be shaken, he will shake. And this is where the world is heading into, into a great shaking that is coming. It's starting, but it's a great shaking that is going to take place upon the earth. However, there is nothing that is a surprise, and there is nothing that is hidden to our God. And so God reveals himself to us in his word so we might be able to stand upon his promises that in turn gives us faith to stand upon what God has said, not man, so we might be able to endure and might be able to overcome the days that we're going to have to walk through. So God is and God exists and God reveals himself by his word. This is the foundation of our faith. And we go to 1 Thessalonians 2.13 and it says this. Now, if you've got your Bibles, you can turn there this morning. I'm just going to continue reading on. 1 Thessalonians 2.13. It says, for this reason, we also thank God without ceasing. You know, let his praise always be on our lips, amen. And all things give thanks for this is the will of Christ Jesus to you. That's what the Bible teaches. Because when you receive the word of God... You heard from us, you welcomed it, not as the word of man. So we didn't hear the word of God and receive it as, as a word that comes from man. But it goes on to say, but as it is in truth, the word of God. So whose word is it? God's word. And then it goes on to say, which also effectively works in you. 
Who though? Who believe? I think that's really powerful. See, the scripture says that it's Christ in us. And in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God and the Word was God. And then later on in Revelation, it calls him the Word. So Jesus is the Word. He is the living Word. And then it says that it is Christ in us. And if it's Christ in us, his anointing that abides in us, then it says that this Word that abides in us is effectively working in you. This is why it says to those who believe they'll lay hands on the sick and cast out demons in my name. Why? Because his word is effectively working in you. The trouble is, is most people don't know who they are. Most people don't know their identity, who God has called them to be. They think it's because you need a pastor or someone else. No, you need a believer who will stand upon the principles and the word of God to know that his word is effectively working in you so that when you lay hands on the sick, they are healed, amen? When you speak to demons, there's an authority. I've seen that many times overseas. Manifestation of of the demonic and people getting set free by the power of his word. Nothing I can do. It's his word that is effectively working in us, amen? Amen? And so we need to remember that. There is an authority you have that God has given you in his word to speak his word and to proclaim his word and to stand upon his word. Can we say amen to that? Hallelujah. So faith can rest on nothing but the word of God. See, to have faith in man is to trust the word of man, but to have faith in God is to trust his word. There are two unmovable things. I'm just gonna read through some Scripture. Some of it may not make sense to you, but I'm just going to whiz through it anyway and make some comments. It says, and we're going to start in Hebrews 6.13. And it says, for when God made a promise to Abraham because he could, not, could swear by no one greater, he swore by himself. <clears throat> Saying, surely... Blessing I will bless you, and multiplying I will multiply you. And so after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise, for men indeed swear by the greater, and an oath for confirmation is for them an end of all dispute. Thus God, determining to show more abundantly to the heirs of promise, that's us, the immobility, meaning the unchangingness of himself, of his counsel, counsel, he confirmed it by an oath that by two immutable or two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we might have strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold of the hope set before us. This hope we have as an anchor of the soul, but sure and steadfast and which enters the presence behind the veil, meaning into the very habitation and presence of God himself. So what it's teaching us there is that there's two unmovable things, two things, two pillars, two things that do not change, and it is God and his word. They don't change. Everything around us in this world is gonna change. Everything changes, everything's shifting, everything's unstable, everything's unsettled, and more and more and more, the instability of life, the instability of our job, everything is shifting and changing, right? But there's two unmovable things, God and his word. And upon this foundation and upon this rock, I will build my house, my spiritual house. Amen? And so... Hebrews 6, 17, we just read, it's telling us when God wanted to guarantee his promises, he gave his own word because there was nothing greater and nothing more unmovable than his own word. So he he used himself. Verse 18 tells us that God can't break his word and because, because his word cannot change, therefore his promise is also unchangeable. And it's saying Later on, as you read down, that to those who have run and accepted and run to the Lord Jesus Christ and accepted him as your Lord and Savior, that you have every reason to grab a hold of this promised hope with both hands and never let go. Amen? Because it's something that is unchangeable. It will not shift and it will not move because it's God and his word. 
It says in verse 19, for it is an unbreakable, unchangeable anchor to the soul. What's the soul? The mind, the will, and the emotions. And the mind is an important thing because the Bible says to gird up the loins of your mind, and it uses the word loins because the loins have to do with reproduction. And if we can affect the thinking, it's the strong man of the soul, then we can affect how we walk and how we do things. But he says his word is an anchor to our soul, amen, that reaches right into the very presence of God himself, amen, because he is the word. So to believe in God is to believe his word. They can't be separated. And so then you place your expectation, your faith upon his word because without faith, it's impossible to please him. Do you believe his word this morning, church? Half of us do. <laughs> Might have caught you by surprise. Is God able to meet all our needs? But do we believe that? Because we can say it, but we, we need to believe it, right? Is God able to heal you? Does his word return void? Does it accomplish all that it was set forth to do? Absolutely it does. And you see, these are his promises where there's no shadow of turning. So we take a hold of them with both hands, right? And we see that it was sin that entered through unbelief to, towards God and his word. Just as we read, there are two unmovable things, God and his word. So God and his word didn't change in the Garden of Eden. It was faith and obedience towards God and his word in the Garden of Eden. Remembering that the devil is a deceiver and he always dresses up lies to look like truth. Remember what he said to Eve? He said, you won't surely die. You'll be like God. It's a half truth. So Satan opposes and challenged the word of God that God had already given to Adam and Eve. It was unmovable and unchangeable. He'd already given the words. And so Satan comes to bring doubts, to get us to question, to bring unbelief and doubt in what? In God and his word. And so God's word to Adam was, in that day you eat, you shall surely die. <clears throat> and you see, deception is always mixed with error. Or deception is always truth, I should say, mixed with error. It's just like a counterfeit money. It looks like the real, it, it, you know, it's hard to distinguish it sometimes. So it's truth mixed with error. It's the bending of truth to lead us away from the real truth of the word and place us ultimately into a place of unbelief. In other words, to doubt and to question God's word. And let's be honest, how many times have we questioned God's word? I've done it plenty of times. How many times have we reasoned God's promise away because we haven't seen an answer? haven't seen a result or we haven't seen the visible evidence of the things we were expecting to happen in our own understanding. And the best example we can use is when people believe for healing or they've got a doctor's report or they've got ailments in their body and they might have received some prayer and not seen an answer. And other times we do see an answer and we go, well, what's going on, Lord? Has his word changed? No, but he's still God. And he goes on to say that his ways are beyond finding out for his ways are not his way, our ways. And his thoughts are even higher than our thoughts. So sometimes we just have to trust him that it's his word. That he's gonna do it how he does it. He still heals, absolutely. Has he forgotten you? No, he hasn't. Does he still love you? Absolutely, no doubt about it. So if the principal thing is God and his word, then we've gotta stand upon it and not move from it. In fact, the Bible teaches and says, having done all, you stand. In fact, I almost spoke on the armor of God. Remember the armor of God? So the, the belt of truth, the sword of the spirit, the breastplate of righteousness, the helmet of salvation, the shield of faith, having your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. So we put on the full armor of God and it says, having put on the full armor of God, what do we do? Stand stand we stand and if we understand that God changes not 
He's the same yesterday and forever, then we're not to move from that position of truth because the natural is always subject to the spiritual. Everything is going to conform to the Word of God, whether you like it or not, whether you resist it or not, God's Word is the only unmovable thing, God and His Word. And so this is a time where God wants us to knit together as one body. We're meant to stand together in unity, in one body, not to break rank. And I want to challenge you this morning to, to remain steadfast and unmovable upon truth because it's only His truth that can set you free. And if you're struggling in any area of your life, reach out to someone. Reach out to someone. Call for help. Put on the whole armor of God. Get some grit and some perseverance and stand and continue standing. Amen? Because sometimes the trials that we go through are challenging and they're difficult and sometimes it's an endurance to go through the, the difficulties in life. And, and you see the picture there of Moses and what did Mo, who did Moses have? He had Aaron and her that came alongside him to lift up his arms in battle when, he got, when they got tired. And sometimes we need someone else to get beside us, to lift up our arms, to pray with us, to stand with us, to encourage us. And it can just be a simple text or something. Sometimes we need it. But especially us men, we like to, we like to try and deal with things on our own because we're all fix-it guys. We like to fix things if it's broken. We like to tinker, try and sort it out. Oh, we, we can work it out. But you know, the days are coming where we're just gonna have to have one another more so in our lives to support and encourage each other. <clears throat> Hallelujah. So it's okay to ask for help. It's not a sign of weakness. It's actually a picture of the body of Christ working together where each part supplies. Each part is needed and each part supplies <clears throat> and sustains the other. However, at some point, God's word shall come forth for his word's already declared and it's already been spoken and it has the final say. There's a lot of stuff that's gonna come upon this earth. COVID was just the start of something. There's things far worse than that coming, I'm telling you. That's just the start of things. A lot of people buckled, didn't know how to do things. It really dislodged stuff. But you see, we don't walk of a spirit of fear. I hear stuff all the time, but I know who my God is. And you know what, if it costs me my life to serve the Lord, I'm okay with that because that's an honor. Because if I'm not willing to lay down my life for the Lord, then I don't know if I'm really worthy to follow him in the first place because he laid down his life for me. And so it means there's something that needs to shift in the hearts of men to realize who he is as God and his word and what he's given us. And we'll stand with boldness, amen? And we need to stand with boldness. Not to be all weird or anything like that. We're not gonna be all religious and, and stuff like that, but to stand and go, you know what? My God's got this. My God has got this. And so our duty then is to abide and we're to make Jesus our habitation, to remain and continue in the faith regardless of anything. Because we're in a season where there's going to be many deceiving spirits to come and bring half-truths, to bring deception, to bring accusations, to try and bring division amongst your brothers and sisters, right? It says, it even go, the scriptures even go on to say that the love of many will wax cold. And brother will hand over brother and think he's doing right. Man, people are on the phone call during that whole COVID time. Hey, man, I've seen two people here together. They're not social distancing. They're not doing all this. And they're handing people over, thinking they're doing right. Come on. Are we scared of that stuff or not? You hear what I'm saying though, right? We're still to be wise and that sort of thing. But it uses the word love there. The love of many will wax cold. And that word love there is the word agape. And it's actually, so it's actually talking to the church that the love within the church for your brother and your sister will wax cold. It's not talking out in the world, it's talking within the church. So this is where we need to be watchful. People can say things and do things and rub us the wrong way, you know. We talk about a little bit of people come like sandpaper in our lives. 
Man, I've met some people, they're not sandpapers, they're like an electric planer. <laughs> right? <laughs> but it's there. What for? For our benefit. Because all things work together for good to those who love the Lord. That's a promise. Unmovable thing again. Amen? <clears throat> And you know, we're already seeing lots of stuff happen across the face of the earth that, that I call a great deception. And I know a lot of churches don't talk about some of these things and talk like this, but you know, these things bother me. When I, when I look across this world and I see that people are questioning, especially the younger generation, whether they're a boy or a girl, that bothers me. That wasn't around when I was growing up. And you see, this is what the Bible calls a great deception. It's not something normal, and yet it's portrayed as something normal. So the abnormal is becoming normal, and it comes with laws, and it comes with fear uh, towards anyone that would oppose any of these things. And you see, the Bible tells us that we're to judge things by its fruit. So if I see control and fear and manipulation and all those things, I know the fruit of that thing is not from the God that I serve. So the fruit of it is telling you where it's coming from. And, uh, and the Bible calls that a deception. And somehow, these things have come upon the earth. I don't even know how it's happened in the first place, do you? But I shake my head at it. I know it's not right. I know I'm, happy, I'm not happy with it. And so God tells us that in the midst of all this stuff, that's just the start of it. And the Bible also goes on to say, but who will sigh and cry for the abominations that are happening upon, upon the earth? Meaning who is going to cry out? We're just all aware of it, but we do nothing about it. Who is going to be the ones that are going to get on their knees and say, Lord, this is wrong, and begin to cry out for what we see and what we hear? Who is going to cry and sigh? And it's much like Jesus, when he, before he went to the cross, he said to his disciples, will you pray of me one hour? And they fell asleep. And the hour was dark. And he needed his, his people to begin to stand with him and pray. But you see, the one thing that gets diminished in a church and, and in this hour is prayer. Unless it directly affects us and we have a struggle in our life, then we want prayer. But what about other people? What about these things that are happening in the world? It's like our conscience, the Bible says, is being seared with a hot iron. It doesn't bother us, but it should bother us. These things aren't right. And so God tells us that all this stuff that I've just mentioned is beginning to happen, and it's going to get worse and worse and worse. So God says, I need you to hold the line and stand in his truth to place our stance and our faith upon those two unmovable things. What are they, church? God and his word. Amen. Hallelujah. I'm just wondering if I continue on or not. I'm going, if you look at my notes, man, I'm going all over the show this morning. But anyway, that's okay. <laughs> Praise God. Mark 9.24, it says, And straight away the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. I've prayed that prayer. So the first thing to mention here is that faith is not mental assent or intellectual, an intellectual thing. Faith, it's not head faith, it's heart. Bible faith is the heart, not the head. And what I mean by that is that faith is not just the mental acceptance and belief of Bible facts and truths because faith about any action is dead. Bible faith is a living faith. It is life. Then this man said in this verse, Lord, I believe. So he believes. That's mental faith. The Bible also says, even the demons believe and they tremble. Then he said, help my unbelief or help my lack of appropriating heart faith. Help me walk in it, help me do it, help me live it. Because it's possible to just intellectually believe the scriptures, yet have no faith to experience the truths and the promise that's written there. 
But you see, we needed a faith that God gives us that it's not just here, but it's a conviction in here that causes us to stand upon the word and not move. <clears throat> a simple example is my boys, when they hurt themselves, which seems to be every day, if not a couple of times a day, and uh, when they hurt themselves, they, they realize they need prayer. And the first thing they do is come to us for prayer. So they have, a, they have the knowledge or the understanding that God heals. And so what they do is they then put that faith into action and they come and ask for us to pray. So that's faith in action. It's not just the knowledge of it and doing nothing about it. You understand that? Yeah. So God has placed an assurance in our hearts that these things we hope and expect we will receive that our faith will become seen. Amen? And our expectation that we'll see these things manifest in the natural with our eyes because we've spoken it out in the spiritual. So because there's two unmovable things, God and his word, and the link uh, towards that is faith. So faith believes to see, not sees to believe. Amen? And if you want to walk with people, you know, this is the reality. We, if you want to walk and do life with people, there's a cost to, to do that. Most people don't want to do it. There's a cost to sometimes get on your knees in the morning or late at night and begin to pray for people, begin to stand there and, and intercede for them and speak the promises of God over their life. But as you do that, you'll begin to see things begin to shift in their life, you'll begin to see change begin to take place. And the amount of times we've been praying for people, then next thing you know, change begins to happen. Stuff begins to change because of the power of prayer. Amen? <clears throat> and when we go through wars and we go through struggles, you know, wars and struggles are not, in the natural, not one in one day usually. Sometimes it takes a little bit of a battle and the church, whether you like it or not, if you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, then you're in a battle of everything that opposes the word of God and everything comes from the pit of hell. Because ultimately, this is a battle between light and darkness. And at the end of time, the conclusion of time, that's what it's going to be. A kingdom of light and a kingdom of darkness. And we know the scripture says, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood. So it doesn't matter how good you are at fighting. It doesn't matter how tough you are. It doesn't matter about your strength or your size. I mean, look at Goliath. He was a pretty big dude. He was a giant, right, in the Bible. So we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, against rulers of the darkness of this world. See, that's spiritual. Against spiritual wickedness, in high places. And so we need to get into a battle array, church, because of what's coming. Get ready. Just keep praying and declaring God's word because it releases the anointing that abides in you to break the yoke, the Bible says. And so we understand our authority in Christ Jesus. And I've, I've said this once before. We, a lot of people, they pray like they're trying to break through something. And I understand there is a a breakthrough anointing to change circumstances. But when you realize that we are seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, even though I'm here naturally, Jesus paid for my salvation by the cross of Calvary. And it says that we were uh, buried and resurrected in Christ Jesus. He did it for us. Amen? And so we are seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So when we pray... We are praying from a position of being above, speaking down with authority to the circumstance. You understand that? This is why the Bible says that you are the head and not the tail. You are above and not beneath. And we need the revelation of who God has called us to be as sons and daughters of God to begin to stand in the authority and the purposes and the calling that God has for us. Too many people are walking downtrodden because they don't understand who they are who God's called them to be.